Okay. So one reason, uh, John, one reason I'm uh, watching this and the one tomorrow is that my daughter Kelly has been uh, getting a new job for the BOCES down in around Ithaca. And oh, she's nice. out working with uh, classes and students and teachers on putting together educational stuff, uh, videos, and uh, also, uh, um, you know, the uh, free or almost free stuff that you're, I'm going to attend that one tomorrow. And, uh, you know, she, I could probably pass some of the stuff on to her just sure. to give you an idea where I'm coming from. Sure. Uh, no, that would be great. And, you know, and she could watch any of the videos for any of the sessions. And, sure. You know, she, so is she entirely doing professional development now or is it a mix? Uh, yeah, she, she uh, works with some faculty and putting together, uh, you know, uh, robotics, uh, you know, uh, what is it, TikTok or I forget the names. <laughs> the TikTok videos? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and there's a number of different ones, you know, some of them I've never heard of that she's uh, gets to review and then present. And she puts on video uh, presentations and so forth. Anyway, I'll let you go ahead. Okay, um, we can get started. Um, Scott, is there anything specific you're looking for? Uh, not really, John. I Some of it I probably use for myself. Oh, I'll get another person <laughs> I'll pass on. Okay, uh, Scott. Hey, Bill and John, it's Scott Harrison over at Campus Recreation. So John, when I saw the presentation, I, I thought uh, we're always um, telling ourselves or I'm you know, in, in, as colleagues that are working with student staff as sports officials, that the very best way to get better and uh, to improve is to see ourselves officiate. Mm -hmm. um, and so second to that would be to see others, right, uh, officiating. And so video really has become the standard within student development um, in the officiating position. Um, it goes across, you know, many different skill sets and, and uh, career pa uh, paths, but uh, that's my most uh, specific interest in the training. Okay, so I'll see what I can do to tie that in. Some of it won't apply directly, but some of it will work but I'll try to keep it as connected as I can. So basically, I wanna talk about ways in which we can fairly easily do this without killing ourselves uh, because video production can be really elaborate, but it can also be really, really simple. And that's the point I, I'd like to encourage. Um, just, um, I didn't mean to try to print this. Let me, <laughs> I've been doing that periodically all day, um, all week. Um, and now I completely closed that window when I was trying to fix it. Let me bring it back over. I've got another copy of it here. There we go. Okay, one more time. So um, I'll just keep my finger on the cursor keys. Um, so why create video? Certainly for, for reviewing how people are doing is a really good way. You know, as, as faculty also recording our classes could be a good way of going back and reviewing how we've done and where we could have done better. Um, but. I'm thinking most of this presentation is focused around creating videos that you want to share with students, which, which could apply in the circumstance you described too, um, where you're examining good practices and maybe practices that didn't work as well for, um, you know, for, for people to study. Um, one way of doing this, so, and one thing, my motivation mostly has been to create, especially in my online classes, more of a sense of instructor presence so that the students in my classes know that I'm there. They know that I'm a real person. It's not just this text appearing on the screen. And it creates a sense of immediacy, which is a sense that you know the person a little bit more. You get more sense of presence. Um, a term that's been used a lot, especially during the pandemic when everyone's been work, so many people have been working remotely and not interacting as much in person, is it tends to humanize the instructor rather than it being with this distant authority figure, it brings them right into the class with you. Um, and also it provides multimodal instruction that you know, early online classes in particular were mostly text-based. And even most of what we assign our students tend to be text-based. They read textbooks. But there's a lot of research that shows that when students see the same information from different perspectives, some of it by reading, some of it by watching videos, some of it by watching demonstrations, they learn a whole lot more than if they only see it from one perspective. That by using different approaches and different modes of instruction, it tends to 
create a little more interest, a little more engagement, and provides multiple sources of connections to make it easier for students to fit new knowledge into their existing body of knowledge. Um, it can also be used to help address some common misunderstandings. One thing, for example, if you're teaching a class either in person or online or some combination, if you see some common mistakes in student work, if you're grading something, for example, and you see people are making the same mistakes over and over again, a really simple thing to do to help correct it is to take if, for example, people are trying to use some software and they're having trouble with it, or if they're trying to, um, if they're having some trouble analyzing something, you could create a short presentation of just one or two or three or five minutes, create a short video of it where you could do a screen capture where you're recording what's on the screen, share that with students, and then, um, and then they could see, <laughs> they could, uh, it's a quick way of getting information out. You don't have to wait for the next class meeting. You can just quickly share it, provide feedback to help them create uh, to correct mistakes. And in the example you talked about, if you're, you know, if you were recording students doing something in a in a in a phys ed class or in, in some type of coaching application, you can record it, share that video with them with some feedback. You could even embed some comments in it or you know highlight things, freeze it, and so forth. Um, it also can help provide visual cues that when we send text to people and when we send email to people, there's a lot of research that suggests that when people can take, when they read text messages or comments written on a discussion board, for example, if there's multiple ways in which the feedback can be interpreted, when people see text, they're more likely to be biased towards a negative perception of it. It's one of the reasons why so many discussion forums have turned perhaps a little bit toxic, that people will often read comments as being more critical than is intended. But when you record video, people can hear the tone of your voice. You can hear the, the intonation. You can see that they're smiling when they say something. And that makes a difference in interpretation. People are much, le much less likely to misperceive comments when they can see your face, when they can hear your voice, when they can hear the tone of your voice, than if they just read words on a page um, or words on an email or, you know, a message of some form. You know, the equipment needed to record videos, this goes back to the easily create. Uh, any laptop can be used to create videos because they pretty much all have webcams. It's been a long time since I've seen a laptop that didn't have a camera built in. Pretty much all mobile phones, you really have to search really far to find a mobile phone that doesn't have a camera in it. Um, most tablet computers also have um, cameras in them, sometimes with lower resolution. But if you're going to use a tablet and you're going to record yourself talking, you probably want to put it, even with a mobile phone, you probably want to put it on a little mini tripod. You know, you can get these little cheap 5 to $10 things, which are basically just, you know, three posts that tilt out where it just hangs it so that you get it fixed in position. You know, if you want to get really sophisticated and you're recording things elsewhere, you could actually get a full tripod with an adapter that will hold your smartphone or tablet and record right from there. And, you know, the, um, the resolution, the video resolution from smartphones and even many tablets is often much higher than cameras, unless you're going to spend a thousand dollars or more on the camera, you can often get higher quality video from a smartphone although they often cost about the same, but um, you can get really high quality video from smartphones today. Um, and some other things, if you're going to be recording a lot of videos, the quality of the video itself and what research has found in general is the quality of the video doesn't matter that much. It could be a little bit grainy. It could be a little bit blurry. That doesn't matter as much in terms of instructional use as audio, that if students have trouble understanding your voice, that's going to lead to a much lower perception of the quality of the video than if they, than if your picture is a little bit blurry. And one reason for that is simply that many students will watch videos on their smartphones and smartphones have those tiny little screens. So even if it's a little bit blurry, if you were putting it on a big, you know, 4K display, when they're looking at a smartphone, it's generally going to look really crisp. Even if they're looking at it in a computer, even if it's a little blurry, that doesn't matter so much as long as they can hear you clearly. So if you're going to go above just using your basic smartphone or your basic tablet or your laptop, one thing you might think about investing in is just a little bit higher quality microphone. Um, a common one that many people have used is this, um, the 
the blue snowball mic, which you, I think they may have even stopped manufacturing or they may still be. The basic one you can get for about $50 or so. There's lots of other inexpensive mics. I just got a new one, actually. Oops. I just got a new one uh, yesterday that came in, a Shure mic. It's a little bit more expensive. It's a couple hundred dollars, but I use these microphones all the time for the podcast and other things. So, you know, I invested a bit more in, in this one. Uh, I've got a lot of them around. You could also get a higher quality webcam if you really, you know, if you got lots of extra money to spend around, uh, spend, um, because I do so much with video, I do have a 4K one. It's, I think now this one sells for about $180, but, but I use it every day, generally for seven or eight hours a day in practice with Zoom meetings and everything else. Um, but you could also use a DSLR camera or a video camera, you know, if you have those available. Um, there's a lot of really good free or inexpensive video editing software. If you have an iPhone, an iPad, or a Macintosh, a Mac computer of any type, iMovie is a really powerful video editing package and it's free. It comes with, um, it comes with any, pretty much any Apple product. And it has really good capabilities of cutting, mixing, blending, doing transitions between video clips, reordering things, adjusting audio levels, doing voice overlay on top of videos you've recorded. And it's really got a very remarkably simple interface. Um, so that's a really good, I, you know, for basic editing, that's what I'd recommend. If you happen to be in the Apple environment, there are some good tools on Android, but not quite as many. One that works, let me rephrase that. There's there's more variety in Android apps, but they tend not to be quite as powerful or not free. One good free tool is Adobe Premiere Clip, uh, which is available on Android. It's basically a stripped down Adobe video editor. And the equivalent version on an iPhone is Adobe Premiere Rush. So it's a stripped down version of Adobe Premiere that, that will do things very similar to iMovie. And it's, it's got a fairly intuitive interface. So that's something you may wanna consider. Uh, if you're at Oswego, um, Panopto is a simple screencasting tool we can use where you can record anything that you see on your computer, as well as anything on the web camera. And you can also use it to um, on smartphones. You could do it if you're demonstrating an app on your phone, you could do a screen recording of that app. So you can show people how to open the app, how to use various things, how to edit within that, how to connect to Blackboard, how to use various apps mobile tools if you choose to. Or you could open up a PowerPoint display or Google Slides and do a screencast or screen recording directly on uh, an Android or, well, actually on, on Apple products, it's pretty easy with Panopto. The Android version, I don't think will record the screen. The, my recollection is, I haven't tried this recently, Panopto on Android will let you play videos that are stored in Panopto, but I don't think it will record. Um, the, the editing capabilities with that are limited pretty much to trimming off the beginning and the end. Doing anything more sophisticated, you'd be better off with one of these other packages. Um, if you want to do a lot more editing and you're working on a laptop, Screencast-O-Matic is a really good tool. The free version is similar to Panopto in terms of it only having basic editing and basic cuts. But if you pay for it, and there's two versions of it, one which is, I think, something like $1.50 or $2 a month. And then there's another one, which is $4 a month. The basic version, which is I think $1.50 a month, gives you a pretty full set of editing tools. You can do transitions, you can copy and paste clips, you can blend things together, adjust audio levels, you can clean up some of the audio. You can do green screen animations where if you happen to have a solid color background, you could make it transparent and you could add overload, overlays of other videos as your background. So you could do, you know, like the weather type person where you have a blue screen and you put up a weather map and do the talk over it. Um, you know, that's, it's got a lot of really good tools for something which is fairly inexpensive. Um, the, the more expensive version also gives you lots of video, more sources of music, background music and, and images and more transitions and other things you can drop in. But um, the, I have the, the less expensive version of it, and I've used it for some previous workshops. Adobe Premiere, as a member of the campus, you can request from CTS. It's an extremely powerful program. 
but it's because it's so powerful, it's a lot more complicated, or at least from my perspective, I found it to be a lot more complicated. I use it, but only as a last resort. And the one case where I use it regularly is when we've had guest speakers where we've had three or four people recording that, where we do, for example, when back before COVID, we would often have a guest speaker either over in, um, in Sheldon Hall, or we'd have them over in the campus center in the ballroom. And typically what would happen is we would record the PowerPoint screen as one source of video that they were presenting from. And then we'd have two or three people out there either with DSLR cameras or with, with smartphones recording them from different angles. And the one thing I've always used Adobe Premiere for, and pretty much the only thing I tend to use it for, is to do a multi-camera edit. Because what it will do is it will take all those videos it will track the audio in them and use that to sync up the videos. And then you can have up to four different camera angles active at any one time. And essentially you can watch it and do cuts, jumping from one camera angle to the other, just to add a little bit of visual interest or so that you can see people talking or interacting and then going back, going back to the slides when that's appropriate, when there's a new diagram coming up. So. You know, it's really powerful. And as a member of the campus, you can have it installed on your campus computer. But again, I wouldn't recommend it for casual editing. What I actually use the most is Camtasia. Um, I think the initial version is somewhere around $200. And then after that, it's like $50 a year for an update. Or if you want the next version of it, I have a subscription to it. And I'm pretty sure it's $50, maybe $54 a year to get new updates every year. Um, and that's, I've been using that for about, 15 or 20 years now. Um, so I, I paid for it quite a while back. And I actually paid for two versions because you're allowed two licenses with each. I'm licensed on two Windows machines and two Mac machines. And I go back and forth between home and work. So it was just easier for me to do that. So now those are the basic tools. And you know, there's lots of good materials on how to use those um, in LinkedIn Learning and other places. And things like iMovie is pretty intuitive. Just by playing around with it, you can discover a lot. In terms of instructional use, a welcome video is a really good way of creating a video for students. Um, another thing you can do, and this would come back to your use case, Scott, is recording live events, experiments, demonstrations, and so forth. And basically, you just go out there and record whatever it is you want to record. Um, you could either do it manually holding the camera, putting it on a tripod with some type of an adapter, or, um, or just using a widescreen view and just recording whatever you're whatever you're trying to capture. Um, it's a great way of recording concerts or sporting events or museum visits or field trips. If you're teaching classes like geology or meteorology and you wanna capture something that's happening where you are, just record it and then post it as a video and share it with your students. Can also be done, particularly when we're working remotely, to demonstrate an experiment. If you're doing a chemistry experiment, you can record it. You can even do it from multiple camera angles, mix it all together or demonstrations um, and share it with students for that. Screencasts, uh, if you're teaching a flip classroom where you're spending your class time working through problems, instead of lecturing and boring your students while you're in class, you could do that outside of class and create short videos that basically capture the same sort of content and then share it with students. And we talked about this in another workshop, you could even embed some questions on it just to see if they understand things and to encourage a little more focus on it, um, as well as recording demonstration, recording student presentations, student athletic performance, student musical performance, student singing and so forth, and using that to give students some feedback where you can either just share the recording with them and let them view it and have them respond to it. Or you could perhaps even take the video, use a video editor and add some comments to it. You could pause it, you could circle things and illustrate something where there might be some option for improvement and just make some notes in it. Um, or you could, damp down the sound and do a voiceover for part of it, you know, with some sort of feedback. Um, oh, what some people have done actually is, and I've, I've tried this and it's never worked that well for me, but some students even use videos to do give feedback on papers. Um, one person I know at the University of Buffalo, uh, Je Jess Jessica, I can't think of the last name offhand, but in any case, she has a class with about 100 students and she they write short papers and she gives each of them feedback with short video clips. 
uh, where she skim, she scans through the paper, she's recording the screen, and she's doing a voiceover, giving them comments in it, and then sharing back that video to them with the feedback, because again, it has that advantage of having tone of voice, rather than just those harsh little comments, either as annotations or as, you know, as part of a gradebook column. Um, now, if you're going to do a screencast where you're doing a narration of PowerPoint or something similar, one question that comes up is, should you have a talking head? Most things like Panopto or Camtasia or Adobe Premiere, when you're doing a screen recording, will normally use your, your, um, your web camera and record whatever it can see, basically what you could see here in all those little video boxes. And the argument here is a little bit mixed. Um, one thing that we know, based on eye tracking analysis of students watching videos with talking heads, is that it increases the amount of time that students are actually looking at the screen. So if you have a talking head there, they, they, students naturally tend to focus on your head and watch you as you're speaking. And that could be good if the alternative is they're watching something on, you know, watching a movie or looking at a video game or something else uh, other than just listening. But it, and it also, the advantage is it provides those same visual cues of facial expressions, et cetera. And it does create more of a sense of instructor presence when they can actually see you, especially if you're teaching an online class. But it could also serve to take focus away from more important content. If you're doing a slideshow and there's some images you want to demonstrate, if you want to demonstrate, you know, or if you're showing chemical reactions, or if you're showing chemical bonds, or if you're showing a derivation of some mathematical expressions, or if you want to show clips of code, you know, when you're writing, helping students learn how to program something, um, they, you don't probably want them focusing on your face. You want to have them focusing on the images that you want them to focus on. So, what in general people tend to suggest based on what we've found from research is that it's probably best to do it when it doesn't distract from visual representations that you're trying to share. So having your face here can be useful. And what some people do is they just have a short video, a short introduction and sometimes a short conclusion to their videos where it's just their face on the screen without other content, or they just pop that back in or out depending on what they're doing. But when there's important information on the screen, it's probably better just to leave that on the screen. Um, now, in terms of where you record, obviously if you're in the field, you won't have a lot of choice of that. You, you record where you are. But if you're recording on a computer or on a smartphone, you know, for a video that you wanna share with students, a really helpful thing, going back to that audio issue, is find a place that's as quiet as possible. Um, I can't generally record from the CELT office because there's a coffee shop next to it with a blender, a grinder, and, you know, and other things in there. And there's also a toilet with a one of which has a really noisy valve every time it's flushed. And it gets flushed dozens of times every, every 10 minutes, uh, it seems. So you know, that all ends up in the recording in general. Um, right now I'm running this microphone through a noise gate so that there's not as much background noise and also the coffee shop is closed and there's not as much going on, um, but that an issue. Uh, one thing um, one thing that is, is noticed a lot if you're in lots of Zoom meetings is a lot of people will sit in front of a window um, where there's this bright sunlight, well, not as much this time of the year, but where there's bright sunlight coming in behind you and all you see is this sort of, dark shadows surrounded by this halo of white. You know, if, if you are sharing your screen and you want students to see you talking to them, you probably want them to see you and not just a dark blob, you know, surrounded by this brilliant white light and so forth. So it's probably better to sit in a location where the light is coming at you from the front. Now that could be overhead lights. It could be, you know, the, you can buy all these little light rings and other things. You know, here I'm just in a room where the light's above me and, and that's pretty accurate. You can, it's, it's not bad lighting, um, but it's better if you're recording some type of a recording in a home office or something similar, a best thing to do is to face the window rather than have the window behind you. Um, it creates a much be better visual. Um, here's an interesting thing, and this is something I've always been able to do pretty well um, wherever I am. Having more clutter in the room actually improves sound quality because it absorbs the sound. Um, when we started recording a podcast over in this 
this old control room, there was all these flat walls of, of metal with these metal plates and a big glass wall on one side and a big reflective wall behind it with only like six feet from one to the other. And it sounded like we were in some type of an echo chamber. So one of the things I did is I bought a big, a big shower rod, uh, an extremely long one, and some really cheap curtains and hung them up on one wall to block that out. And I had a green screen, which I put across the big glass window, and I hung some cheap rugs over some of the big plates of metal and, and strains just so that it dampened the sound. So, you know, being in a room where there's curtains can help, being in a room where the worst place is recording from an office with tile floors and with bare walls because you get this really strong echo sound, which distorts it well, which makes it a little bit harder to get crisp sound. Um, another thing is avoiding distracting backgrounds. Um, one of my, a friend of mine who works at FIT, he's an instructor, he is the instructional designer there. He was taking a figure drawing class where they were, they were, um, they were working on new, with nude models and so forth. And he had hung a painting of a nude model behind him. And that tended to distract people when he realized that was, and he realized what was happening that people were focusing on, you know, the, the painting he had on the wall behind them. And he moved that to something much more neutral. Um, having, you know, so having a, a background, which is just kind of neutral is probably a good I mean, this is kind of an ugly background, but sometimes people will set up their place so they've got a nice background behind them with maybe, you know, maybe a bookcase or something similar. But in any case, something that tends not to distract people from what you're trying to do. Um, a main thing is if you're going to be using a lot of videos is keep it simple. The more time it takes you to create a video, the less likely you're going to continue to create videos. Um, Keep videos short and focused. It's good for student attention and it also makes it easier for you. And if you focus just on the things that you really want to convey without a lot of fluff, it's going to be more helpful for students and also less work for you. Um, and another thing, and this is something I have a little bit of trouble with when I record, especially with audio, is that you know, having a little bit of humanizing activity where there might be a cat or a dog or something wandering by, or you might cough or you might sneeze or someone else might wander into the room. That actually is something that students actually find kind of nice. It actually, as long as it's not constant interruptions, it can, again, create that sort of humanizing uh, perception that, you know, you're a real person in a real life and you do have real pets and, and, People often appreciate that. And in fact, I know some people have said when they posted videos where a cat wandered by or a dog wandered by, people will comment on it. Students will comment on it and they say, you know, I really enjoyed seeing your pet there. And um, it's something that people find positive. That's why there's so many pet pictures and so forth on the internet too. Um, it's really important to be enthusiastic in your videos. If you're just going to talk in a monotone and you're just going, you know, if you're going to do something that's it's clear you're not that engaged with it, it's going to come across as perhaps not very engaging to students. That if you're upbeat and positive when you're recording a video, that conveys, a, that tends to be received positively by your students. Um, when, it, you know, if you're providing examples for students, if you can use personal examples and relate it to things that you've experienced in the past, that tends to make more connection with students than if you just describe some generic third person. Um, in creating videos, if you're doing instructional videos, starting with an interesting question to uh, provoke curiosity tends to increase the amount of focus that students will put on it. I know uh, Dan, I took a MOOC with Dan Ariely back before he got in all sorts of concern. I'm not sure if it's there's been proof of this yet, but there's some concern that maybe some of his data was faked. But in any case, in all the videos he created, he started with an interesting question. And then the rest of the video was explaining how they investigated this, what, what sort of tests they did, and what they found, and what the implications of that were. But he'd start off by raising a question that provoked curiosity. And over the course of this, there was this narrative flow where you were gradually building up to an answer to that question. And that tended to lead to much more interest than if you just were to give, you know, a, a point by point PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, and humans have evolved to appreciate narratives that it, if you can weave stories into, um, into whatever it is you're, you're presenting, 
you know, we at one point stories were the main way in which we transmitted knowledge from one generation to another. That storytelling is something that humans respond to really well and it helped people remember things and it provides connections and um, that can be really helpful. Uh, another thing in creating videos is if you can use examples that have some sort of emotional significance that students react to where they might get either happy about or even troubled by, it makes it more likely they'll remember things. And in actually negative emotions are more likely to be remembered longer term than positive ones. And that's partly because of the evolutionary basis of this, that we tend to remember things that could be a threat to us or that are of concern to us more than things that are more pleasant because we needed to do that in order to survive in, in a natural environment of some sort. And you know, in terms of providing videos for students, talking to them, Remind them that you want them to be successful, that you're interested in what they're learning and you're doing all this to help them be successful and let them know that you are concerned about them. And that, that also tends to be really helpful. Now, going through a lot of this quickly, but um, once you record your videos, I would recommend storing them somewhere in the cloud. Uh, the best place probably right now is to upload them to YouTube. And the reason for that is while we can store them on Panopto or Ensemble, on some, both Panopto and Ensemble, I'm pretty sure now have storage limits. Panopto used to have unlimited storage, but now it's going to be capped. So any videos you post on Panopto and Ensemble at some point will be deleted and removed. Um, and that was already the case in... Um, Actually, Panopto videos, I think, are deleted after one semester now or a little over one semester. They'll send a reminder out. Many people miss that. And a lot of people lost all the videos from last spring. Well, actually, what happened is they sent a reminder out saying that the videos would be removed by December 31st. And then it turned out they were removed a couple weeks before that. And a lot of people got really unhappy with that about losing their spring videos. So um YouTube, once you post it there, it's there forever, or as long as you still have an account with them and unless you take them down. Ensemble and Panopto are good, but again, that's subject to the whim of, well, not the whims, but to the contracts and the storage costs and everything else of the campus. YouTube is free. And you know, unless there's something that you really need to keep confined to your class, it's a good place to host it. Vimeo works pretty well too, but you, if you're going to store a lot there, you need to have a paid account and YouTube is free. So I, YouTube is what I use for pretty much everything. Unless when I'm recording classes just for students to look at in case they miss class, I put it in Panopto and then it goes away. And I don't care because the next class, next semester will be a different group of people, different presentations and so forth. But if I wanna create a video that I may want to use more than one semester, and the extent to which you can reuse the videos, the more efficient it is, um, YouTube is a good place. Um, once you create, once you have it on these, you can generate embed codes, which you can place in, in, in announcements if you share them with students, you could place them in an email, or you could embed them in course documents. So each week I have modules where I have a series of embedded videos. Students will see a little video play box. All they have to do is click on the link and it will play the video. And if they want, they can expand it to full screen, but at least it's clear the label is there, they know what it is and they don't have to jump somewhere else to start it. Um, I should note that um, as of the last week or two, you can't embed, um, you can't use Chrome to embed HTML code and anything in, in Blackboard. I discovered that while I was doing a workshop on embedding videos in Panopto and in Blackboard um, on Tuesday. And you can do it from Firefox. I'm not sure if Edge will work. I only discovered later that day about that incompatibility. It was a recent change in Blackboard and or a change in Chrome, but you can still embed it, just use Firefox. Um, in terms of accessibility, if you're going to be sharing videos publicly or with your class, make sure they're captioned. YouTube will do it automatically and it's really accurate, but it doesn't provide punctuation or cap capitalization. And also if you don't have really good audio, it, um, it won't work as well. You can get 97, 98% accuracy if you have really clear audio without a lot of background noise or people talking at the same time. 
But um, if your audio is garbled or if you have a noisy room or a lot of echo or if there's other sounds or multiple people talking, it won't be as accurate and you'll lose more. And in general, you can edit it, but it's a lot of work. So, um, okay. And here's a few resources. And, you know, much of what I'm talking about was summarized by Karen Koster in this book, 99 Tips for Creating Simple and Sustainable, sustainable Educational Videos. And for more details about how to create self-made videos, um, Jason High gave a workshop last year around this time um, that provides some really good tips from a professional videographer. Um, and here's how to more on how to use um, Panopto. And here's a podcast we did. So um, I'll share this with you, but um, do you have any, I wanted to go through the basics quickly so we can focus on any specific questions that you have. Scott, uh, back, back in earlier life in the 80s, I was a varsity baseball coach for 10 years. And at that time, uh, there, were, there was no smartphones, but I did come up with a video recorder with a little screen on it. And uh, like for batting or pitching, it was real nice because I would take the uh, picture when they were either throwing or swinging and immediately I could show them where, where their flaws were or where they need to improve. And the immediacy of it was really helpful rather than saying uh, you need to follow through or you know that type of thing. So I found that type of thing when you're dealing with sports. As far as the referees go, you know, it'll be good to record a half of a game or whatever, it's basketball, and then take the video and use fast forward to go through to it. To jump to the time when you fall. yeah. Rather than watch the whole thing, go to this point and view it ahead of time. You can even put markers in there if you have to, but you know about where the problem is and say, here's what you're doing wrong. And then, and then maybe the next time there's a game, you can record a half at that time and go through and improve that way. You know, I, I know I did some basketball refereeing in college and occasionally I find myself in the middle of a fast break <laughs> or something where, where my positioning was off. But I find that type of thing, especially, you know, looking at a, a person's uh, oh, batting or pitching or whatever, the immediate feedback and then have them do it again. Immediate feedback, have them do it again, I find is... is real effective way to use the videos on that. Yeah, that's a great point, Bill. Uh, it became kind of daunting when we were trying to piece together games, you know, in, in multiple plays throughout the game. And I, yeah, I do like that idea of, you know, not um, setting that as a standard. Uh, and I think throughout the presentation, it was talked about sustainable, right? And keeping it simple because this is just one addition to our responsibilities. But yeah, I like that during the game, you just mark, you know, at 5.05, mm -hmm. you know, we had, um, you know, a close block charge call and we'd like to review or, you know, uh, the lead official was out of position um, you know, Owen, right? Yeah, and review it with Owen in, in maybe in privacy uh, because what we found with the newer officials is, you know, just like any new environment, sure. you know, the stimuli and everything's so moving so fast, they were overwhelmed. And so when we tried to talk about, you know, a play last quarter, they looked at you wide-eyed and, and couldn't recall it or were unwilling to you know, be vulnerable in the dialogue uh, about what constructive feedback that existed. Um, but I, yeah, I think the barrier we need to get over is for them to see it, to mm -hmm. analyze and break it down. And more often than not, we feel that they could come up with the solutions, the corrections without it being condescending or repetitive coming from an authority figure. So those are great suggestions. Thank you. And, you know, if you could have multiple people doing the recording from different positions, too, it might be a little bit easier. Or unless you have someone who's following along and zooming in and out, you know. Yeah. John, one of my questions was uh, one of our certified college officials who was helping us out mentoring our student officials was saying, oh, there's got to be people on campus that, you know, um, would have these skills and would, would be interested. Um, obviously, I'm not necessarily next week. Uh, but 
would there be a particular group, student group or a professor, a faculty member that might be able to incorporate some of the um, capturing of the footage into some experience-based ed uh, that uh, students could you know, embark on? And my guess would be communication studies. Uh... Specifically the broadcasting major or people who are working with video production, but broadcasting is probably that subset of comm studies that would be most helpful. Um, because they do have people who are training to be, you know, to work the camera. And they do have some really good high quality cameras that they use for reporting and so forth. Uh, journalism maybe even might, you know, which would also be part of Comm Studies. Thanks. Yeah, I would think Comm Studies students in general because of both the journal, well, although journalism and partly I think in English as well as Comm Studies, um, but. Yeah, I, I think your idea, you know, the idea of recording it and then having specific points in it rather than sit there and review the whole thing with the, with the student referee, you know, I think that would be a lot more effective. And then recording another one of his or her games after that and then look at it again in, you know, it, it's just like uh, if I'm given an assignment what I would do occasionally was put a copy of a poor paper and then all a copy of what I think would be an outstanding paper. It gives the student would give the students something to judge against. So, you know, if you have an excellent person too, you can say, here's here's an example um, of good positioning to make the call. Yeah. Mm -hmm, exactly. So, but that was really my only question. I think otherwise, yeah, it's kind of a good affirmation that to get up on the horse, back up on the horse and get this thing done here. And you know, if you have a, a reasonably new smartphone, you can get really good high quality videos, mm -hmm. you know, both pixel phones and, and, and iPhones record in 4K video, you know, if they've been produced in the last few years. Well, that's what's so nice about the smartphone. You know, I, I have a cousin who's a golf pro, and unfortunately, he was he filmed some of my swing. <laughs> we were struggling to find the good parts of it, you know. But 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 that immediate feedback is is real important. Not only saying here's what's wrong, but do it again and see you can see incrementally if you're improving or where the problem is. So I think that's a good way to do it. If you're looking for a quick way, and I think that would be the best without getting cameras set up and everything else. Although it'd be nice to have a, some student broadcasting come in and do a half a game or so, and then you know make make those stop points for the students. I think that would be real nice. But an intern, you know, something if you could find a student to intern on that, a junior or senior, mm -hmm. that might work really well. But yeah, if you check with with Com Studies, they could they might be able to refer you to someone who might have some students who'd be interested in that, because that could be something that would be good on their their resume. You know, if they want to apply for videography jobs or reporting jobs as a camera person. Great. Thanks. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, I suppose also cinema and screen studies might be another because they do some recorded videos too. Um. Yeah, I think it's important to have somebody doing it what you would think would be the ideal way. You know, uh, you know, like occasionally I would show them a swing of a pro ball player and say, you know, this is what a good swing looks like and let's compare it to what yours, how you can prove yours. Not, not that yours is bad, but the secret is, can I improve it? Like a batter hitting 300 is good, but a batter hitting 330 is better. So, you know, you, know, you don't want to say it's bad. You want to say you want to improve from that point on. That's uh, Anyway, enough of my baseball talk. <laughs> and, and Bill, I missed, where did you coach? I coached at Hannibal for 10 years varsity baseball and uh and then played for what 50 years or something bill <laughs> well, I, I yeah I, I played a uh, fast pitch softball until up through age 70 I finished second in a national tournament 
and I was like elected into the state softball hall of fame, which was nice. My my career went on so long because I threw a knuckleball, extended my career by 20, 30 years. <laughs> but, but it was fun. I sort of miss it. Of course, now I'm paying because I have a after pitching for 50 years, my rotator cuff isn't doing too well. But other than that, it, it was fun. You know, I you know, I think more kids get involved in sports. Unfortunately, this is off the subject a little bit, but some of these travel teams really, I think, do away with good foundation for the schools for athletes. Because you tell me a fourth grader is that person good enough that's going to be a star on the varsity team or whatever. I found some of my best players in the varsity team were mediocre in junior high, you know, as they grew and worked and so forth. But the travel teams tend to pick what they think is great players and rather than going out in, in the back lot and playing uh, catch for two or three hours after supper, you know, the ones that are playing only practice during the uh, travel team practice and there's usually not enough players for the rest of them. So they sort of give up, you know. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop with that. Well, an interesting thing is there have been some studies of birth dates and people making it to professionals in both soccer and in baseball. And that it depends in large part on what the birth date is. People who were born right off after the age threshold are the ones that are more likely to be selected when they're in middle school and beyond because they were the biggest and the strongest. And so they're more likely to make the travel teams and so forth and get more development and are more likely to become professionals because they were the stars early on. They get more coaching, they get more experience and that tends to stay. So the date of birth is one of the best predictors for people who started as playing youth sports of whether they make it to higher level of performance, which it's kind of interesting. That is neat. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of uh, on the, the school of thought that uh, the, the youth travel uh, leagues are just out of uh, absurd and out of control. You know, you're exhausting families that are already overbooked and scheduled. Um, mm -hmm. I think it deteriorates a lot of different uh, aspects of the joy of sports for the children, as well as um, the family life. But uh, like you said, that's a, that's probably another presentation and, and conversation, <laughs> maybe, maybe for the sportsmanship uh, symposium, <laughs> potentially. Yeah. Yeah, well, I also directed the little league out there. And the uh, first thing I did was take all the scores and stuff out of the paper, you know, and uh, had a conference with a coach. There would be no arguing on the field, the whole business, uh, you know, and uh, I was just out looking for the student, the students, the kids to learn a sport, but have a good time at it. And the year I took over the varsity, we were like 12, 13 kids going out. By the time I finished, we were like 30, 40 kids trying out. You know, because of building up that base, that, that was so important. Absolutely. John, thank you for your well, <laughs> talk. You. Sorry to run off the top. Oh, here. that's okay. I'll stop the recording here, though. I think we've, we've hit most of the video is issue.